distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the inaugural Endowed Professorships Public Lecture. The Endowed Professorship Scheme began in 2005. Through this scheme, the spirit of giving comes together with the pursuit of academic excellence. To date, a total of 80 endowed professorships have been established at Hong Kong U. Each of these 80 gifts came with a story and a dream. Each of the endowed professorships represents a new venture in academic development. We believe the ultimate beneficiary of the scheme is society. Therefore, the Endowed Provisorships Public Lecture Series was instituted to support the university's mission of sharing knowledge with the community. Dr. Philip Wong, a highly devoted alumnus and past chairman of the Hong Kong U Foundation, has been involved with this scheme from the very beginning, in addition to his many other contributions to the university. The Wong family, in fact, have set up a total of three endowed provisions. The Philip Wong and Kennedy Wong Provisorship in Political Economy was established by Dr. Philip Wong and his eldest son, Kennedy Wong, who is a managing partner of their co-founded law firm. Our speaker today, the Philip Wong, Kennedy Wong Professor in Political Economy, Richard Wong, is a professor of economics at the School of Economics and Finance. He is a leading economist who has provided valuable public service and led pioneering studies into the progress of Hong Kong and the mainland. It is very befitting, therefore, that he will deliver the lecture today entitled Understanding Inequality and Intergenerational Mobility in Hong Kong. Professor Chow, Dr. Kennedy Wong, colleagues, staff, students, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to start off this public lecture series on something quite dear to my heart. I hope today to take you through a voyage of exploration about things that sometimes you are very familiar but have not chosen to look at it through the eyes of an economist. Uh, I will take you through 10 parts, and I'm not going to read out the outline. <laughs> Uh, because it is late in the day, I'm quite convinced that some of you will doze off um, because you're all very hardworking people. So um, this is what I propose to do, that I will start off with, um, so that if you were to suddenly wake up, you know, you can still pick up from uh, where you left off. The issue of poverty, inequality, intergenerational mobility was never a political issue in pre-industrial societies. It was a matter of fact. Today they are. The popular press has often interpreted them as a product of unequal power relations between capital and labor, between rich and poor. Um, it was for more than a century thought to be inherent to capitalism. 
and more recently believed to be worsened by cronyism. Although I notice it is probably that even under communism it is not in meaning. My lecture tries to tell another narrative to show why my view is empirically compelling. And we should reassess the options for a new policy strategy. I will give what is a very long narrative on Hong Kong, but to make it compelling, I shall also tell a short one on the United States. Because I think it is not sufficient to look at Hong Kong, uh, induce some observations, some general principles, if those principles are only unique to Hong Kong, the same explanation applicable to Hong Kong should also be applicable to another society, no matter how different. That is a common goal in the pursuit of common understanding of how societies work. But first, a word of caution about narratives, which in social sciences are too often elevated into exalted status of theories claiming too much dignity. To be a theory, it has to confront facts, explain them, and make correct predictions. Until then, theories are fiction. Entertaining, perhaps, but true only by coincidence. So let me start off by reading you a song. <laughs> A fact without a theory is like a ship without a tail. It's like a boat without a rudder. It's like a kite without a tail. A fact without a theory is as sad as sad can be. But there is one thing even more sad. It's a theory without a fact. <laughs> so with that, let me take you through something that a bad habit I've picked up from consultants. <laughs> so if you decide to doze off, I don't want you to miss anything on a subject that is so dear, so I'm going to give you the conclusion right away. <laughs> <laughs> Measured income is unequal for many different reasons. A considerable proportion of it is really noise especially household income. Individual income inequality has been rising you know, over time because of a variety of reasons, surely because of underinvestment in education, and there's also a lack of inflow of quality human capital into Hong Kong. Individual income has not grown very much in Hong Kong for the past 20 years, except among the top 30% of the population. In the past two decades, about 3% of the population have decided not to work for no reason. Most likely, I believe, because of increasingly generous welfare benefits. Minimum wage has no effect on reducing household income inequality and have negligible effects on alleviating poverty, contrary to what the popular press believes. Household income inequality in Hong Kong has been rising because of rising single parent households. Divorce rates are 50% higher among tenants than homeowners in Hong Kong. Remarriage rates are much higher for men than women. Our public rental housing program, the allo allocation criterion in particular, creates incentives for low-income families to divorce. Thereby, as families break up, they create additional housing demand. Broken families probably worsen intergenerational mobility especially among low-income, single-parent families. Many of these families are concentrated in the public housing estates. It is likely to continue to be the case unless something is done. Policy interventions to enhance mobility 
and alleviate poverty must occur when children are very young. We need Head Start programs. Subsidized housing programs should be anchored on home ownership and not rental. Public rental housing today in Hong Kong are operated at a loss that could not even cover development costs. They require huge public subsidies with serious fiscal consequences for the future. Public ownership units, however, can cover development costs and generate public revenues because land premium can be partly recovered. So that is the conclusion, right? Uh, you will wonder, gee, you know, why do I make all these assertions? But I make these assertions because I spent a lot of time studying them, and I will try to uh, show you that it is a narrative that has some compelling empirical basis. <laughs> <laughs> is inequality and intergenerational upward mobility related? We know in many countries, the developed world, that measured income inequality has risen in the last 30 years. We know much less about what has happened to intergenerational mobility because it is more difficult to measure. Many intuitively believe that the two must be related. What is your intuition? Well, most of us tend to think that, well, if your parents are rich, then you'll be rich too. And there will be, if you believe that, you mean you have to believe that upward mobility is going to be limited. This is the same thing as saying that intergenerational income elasticity will be very high. That means if your father has a high income, you will have a high income. Right? So, so it's fairly high. Right? Do you intuitively think, therefore, with little upward mobility, then it must lead to rising income inequality. Do you believe that? The rich get richer. So, wow, the poor get poorer. This doesn't look like it widens up. So let us want to find out whether the intergenerational income elasticity is actually positively correlated and with measured income inequality. This is called the Great Gatsby Curve. The term was coined in 2012 by Ellen Blinder, then chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors in the United States. Um, there's some politics going on in Washington. Right? So you coined this, and then this diagram emerged. This is a scattered diagram of a number of the developed economies in the world. China is there. There, right? Gee, I aim correctly. <laughs> and it shows on the vertical axis, the higher you go up, the higher is the income elasticity, which means the more the society is not upwardly mobile. The rich always stay rich, the poor always stay poor, so there's no mobility. So right up there are countries like China, and next to it, you know, uh, U.S., Peru, etc. The other measure is inequality on the horizontal axis. It's the Gini index of income inequality. The further you get out, the more unequal it is. And here is a scattered diagram that shows, ah, there's a positive, strong, clear-cut correlation. The more unequal the society, the greater the lack of mobility. And this is called the Great Gatsby Curve. I don't know why it's called the Great Gatsby. I thought great, I thought the Great Gatsby was actually a, a, a iconic figure of incredible upward mobility. <laughs> I don't know why. I guess there must be some some joke here, right? So is your intuition now confirmed by facts? 
This positive correlation, however, is actually sensitive to what countries you have included and to how you actually measure income elasticity and income inequality. So you change the definition of the income, how you measure it, the results change. You throw out a few countries strategically, the line will flatten out. Now, why does that mean? Well, isn't that a scattered result of the fact that you had those countries there? That's all. You pick the set of countries, you get a different slope. So, so the correlation you observe is actually meaningless. Because you should really be looking at what happens to inequality over time in these countries when intergenerational mobility either increases or decreases. A cross-sectional scattered diagram, no matter how good the fit, actually tells you nothing. It is a perfect way of how to lie with statistics. <laughs> Indeed, you have to explain not only what you see, but why it happened. Without a theory, you really have learned nothing from the facts you just saw. You have claimed what the data couldn't show. Now our narrative begins in the United States. Let us take a look at the best available study from the United States. This was published only this year by a team of five economists, all of them superstars, led by Raj Chetty, who teaches at Harvard, to help us fix these ideas. In the United States, there has been growing public perception that income intergenerational mobility has declined and inequality has risen. In other words, the Great Gatsby phenomenon is believed to be correct in the United States. So Chatty and his group, and I should explain a little bit, got funding to do an incredible project. We are talking about hundreds of millions of US dollars. Right? And this is what they did. They put together data on 50 million children and their parents. How could you find their parents in the US? Because the US government helped them. They would actually open up all the databases on their census, on the text, and allow them to trace the names of the children with their parents. Doesn't this violate some privacy ordinance? Well, it was obviously done in the very secure conditions, right? <laughs> so no ordinance and no then was broken, right? So they match it. 50 million children with their parents, and they could find out how much money their parents earned over a five-year period, how much money each of the children made over a five-year period, link them together, find out where they live, because 25 or 30 years ago, they live in the same neighborhood. You could search through the entire database to anchor where your parents were. Of course, you would be able to identify all the neighborhood characteristics of that community you were in. So what is the result? Let me hold this off for a minute. The result was totally surprising. Totally surprising. Given that the whole team was funded by a democratic government who was so generous, they were looking for an answer that would help Obama make his presidential address. <laughs> it would have made a perfect address for a Republican president. And all these economists were pretty center-left Democrats. Indeed, one of them, who is a Spanish professor at Berkeley, has openly advocated an 80% marginal tax rate on the rich in America. So these are not, you know, Republicans, you know, right-wing Tea Party guys, right? So let us look at the result. Income inequality has increased over time. This they found. What really happened is that they discovered that children born today, if they make it to the top, it's like Mark 6. 
The chance of winning a Marxist lottery today is exactly the same as the chance of winning a Marxist lottery 10 or 20 years ago. But if you win it today, the lottery price is much more larger. Right? So basically today, if you make it to the top, you make a lot more than if you made it to the top 30 years ago. So the birth lottery today rewards people who make it to the top much more. The next thing is the relationship between the parents' income and the child's income in terms of percentile rank, meaning how top you are, 100 percentile, 90 percentile, 80 percentile, hasn't changed in the United States. This was absolutely shocking because everybody believed the United States intergenerational mobility has worsened. This shows it hasn't. This is the most comprehensive data by some of the best economists, very sophisticated, you know, not only in terms of methods, but because of the data they had. And it hasn't happened. This is surprising. So think of it as, as the following. If you go back 30 years ago, Americans were climbing the ladder. Today, you're climbing the same ladder, but the ladder, the rungs have become further apart. So income inequality has widened, but the number of steps on the ladder actually hasn't changed. In other words, the probability of you making up to the top hasn't changed. This was what is surprising. So this is what they found in the data. The data showed that people who came out into society in the 1970s all the way until the 1990s, the probability of somebody moving up the ladder hasn't changed. It's pretty fast. fast. And it is about 0 0.3. In other words, if you understand the number 0 0.3, it means the following, that a person in the bottom quintile has a 30% has a has a 30% chance of moving up to the next step. In other words, if you work out the mathematics, it means shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations. So if you, if your father were Bill Gates, his great grandson would be penniless. Well, you can't prevent that, but that's what it means, the probability. Actually, this has been a number that has been discovered for the United States again and again. We will show you the number in Hong Kong towards the end. That is, if you haven't fallen asleep or decided to leave. So we'll hold off that number until the very last. <laughs> this is also very interesting, and it basically says, um, well, let me move on. We don't need all that much data, so let's move on. This is interesting. Although, over time, intergenerational upward mobility hasn't changed, the mobility pattern across the United States is very different. Areas where it is very deep red are areas where mobility is very low. Areas where it is lighter, you have higher mobility. And the highest mobility are in these areas, and maybe here too. California is upward mobile. Miami is not, for example. Why, what explains the differences in mobility pattern across the United States in different locations? They discovered four factors, segregation. Racial segregation, class segregation, inequality in an in area, the quality of education that children receive in that area, and finally, family structure. Whether you grew up with a single parent or you grew up with both parents. And of all these four factors, the, by far the most powerful factor 
is family structure. Upward mobility correlated with the percentage of single mothers in a community has a correlation of 0 0.764. That's pretty high. Nothing comes even close to such a correlation. So, let me come to another book by Charles Murray, Coming Apart, again published last year. Now, here's the puzzle. This book, Coming Apart, is about the state of white America in 1960 to 2010, 50 years of white America. So it only studies white Americans. There are no racial, ethnic factors there. Here's a puzzle I want to pose to you. If the low-income, high-divorce families, the single-parent families, are having a low upward mobility factor, how is it possible, and America has become more and more divorce-prone, why is the overall nationwide mobility over time unchanged? Something doesn't seem right. Well, coming apart and the data tells you what has happened. Those who manage to stay together have kids that go to Harvard. If your parents stay together, wow, their chances today have improved a lot more. Whereas those whose parents don't stay together have worsened a lot more. On average, it's the same. <laughs> On average in society, it's the same. So this is the US narrative. Let me move on now to talk about other things. Now I'm going to talk about individual income inequality. And you will notice that individual labor earnings, I'm going to make a sharp distinction between individual earnings and household earnings. Individual earnings is the earnings of an individual. Household earnings is the total of the earnings of the individuals in a household. Most people are concerned with variations in household income inequality because that is a family decision unit. But before I deal with household income inequality, let me first deal with individual income inequality. Individual earnings is a sum of the wage rate and the hours a person works. Therefore, if wage rates are very unequal, earnings will be very unequal. If hours of work are very unequal, so would earnings. Right? What determines wage rates? Education, soft skills, health care, these are the factors that determine wage rates. What determines hours of work? Wow, that's very complicated. Wage rate, whether you are independently wealthy, how much tax, do you receive welfare subsidies? If you tax more, you work less. If you receive more wealthy welfare subsidies, you work less too. Uh, health, well, you know, how many hours depend on how healthy, macroeconomic conditions, and your ability to work with others. Lifetime earnings is earnings at a point in one's life cycle. So when you really compare someone here, this is a person with a degree education, and this is age. The older you get, the higher your earnings until you finally drop off, right? And this is higher earnings. Now you will notice that at a young age, a degree graduate has a very low earnings compared to a fairly senior secondary school graduate. So, so at a moment in time, there are many reasons why individual income varies. One is actually age, the other is education. And you would not call a low income, univer fresh university graduate poor compared to a very senior secondary school graduate. So, let me compare this. This is an interesting figure. We are looking at, over time, the age of the person, and we are looking at this factor. This is what the green line tells us 
the difference between college graduate earnings versus secondary school matriculation graduates. This is 2011. This is 1981. You notice for almost most of the years, it is higher. What does that mean? It means it pays more. It is more worthwhile now to get a university education compared to a secondary school graduate. Because in almost all years after the initial few, you make a lot more earnings. So that means you should, people should be, what does that mean? That means there are too few university graduates. Right. If you train more, their earnings will come down. It's the same with any profession. You trade more of them, they appear. Now, this, I always complain that too many economists. <laughs> so, so this is one of the real problems, right? So. Now, another thing that I want to, to let you on is the following. This is around the change in earnings in around 1981 to 1996. And you look at people with different income deciles. These are the wealthy guys. These are the relatively poor guys. And you notice the following has happened. In, for the first 15 years from 1981 to 1996, the low income people experience a considerable increase in their income each year, about five, six percent a year. The high income guys also had a high growth rate, six, seven percent. But look at these guys. This is from 1996 to 2011. Gee, the bomb 30% has zero change. This is over 15 years. The high income group is better. They have 2% increase every year, which is not much compared to the past. Right? So, so this is a pattern. Why has it occurred? And I want to show you this number. This is a number. They look at, focus on the bright yellow lines. The bright yellow lines tell us, us over the period, this is 1961 to 71, 71 to 76, and so on, until more recent. The yellow lines are the growth rates of tertiary educated people in the population. And you notice, in the 1960s, the growth rate was very low. Then it became higher, drop off here, it grew very rapidly, rapidly, incredibly rapidly, but this is a little bit distorted. This is the day, these are the days where the polytechnics became the universities, right? So it's a little bit distorted. So this is called relabeling, right? Then it fell off. In the last 15 years, the growth rate has been dropping. Not dropping, I mean, the growth rate has leveled off. It hasn't grown that much. So we're not training as many people. And notice another thing, let's compare ourselves with our favorite uh, partner in uh, Singapore, right? We really like them. So this is comparing Hong Kong and Singapore. These are, I think, uh, Hong Kong men. These are Singaporean men. This is the average schooling of the male population in Hong Kong during this year. This is around 1981. Average schooling of men is men and male adults was 7.3 years of school. In Singapore, it was 5.6. This is men. Then, in 1990s, we were 8.3. Singapore was 7.3. Then in 2000, we were 9.2. Singapore, 9.2. In 2011, we were 10.2. They overtook <laughs> us. Good for them. Okay. So, well, same thing happened to the women. So we had, we were ahead, and then we fell behind. I'll skip. And then another thing that you are noticing, something very important, you know, uh, Hong Kong people complain we work very long hours. But let's compare us with the Singaporeans. The cross hatch, these are men, these are the women. Right? The, the, the pink ones are the women, the green, blue ones are the guys. And you notice this longer bar is Singapore, this shorter bar, this blue bar is Hong Kong. 
They, what are these? These are labor force participation rates. That means, just, are you working or are you not working? And you look at the men. Gee, interesting. Singaporean men seem to be love work more than Hong Kongers. <laughs> Except when they are very young. Except when they are very young. But then they are studying. They are studying, right? And look at the women. Gee, the Singaporean women like to work a lot too. Right? More than Hong Kong women. So, except that here, and when they are young, the women don't like to work. But then they go to school. So you have seen that actually Hong Kong has changed. Hong Kong has changed. The belief, the myth that we are hardworking, that uh, we are, uh, you know, is, uh, we, are, we still are. But, but others have moved ahead. You know, they, they seem to love work a lot more. This is my, one of my favorite charts. This, this, this is this wonderful data collected by the Hong Kong Census and Statistics Department that uh, I really, you know, I spend all my time looking at those numbers. And this is, they have this thing, uh, and that is, are you working? And they say, no. Why are you not working? And they say, I'm sick. Okay, you cannot work. Why don't you work? Oh, I'm in prison. So things you cannot work. <laughs> and that means, why are you not working? Because I'm in school. Then they ask, is there any reason why you're not working? No reason. So these are the guys who have no reason not to work. Right? These are not women homemakers, because homemaking is also work. So that's classified as you, you know, doing something. Here are the guys who are doing nothing for no reason. Right? No reason. So in 1976, the guys who are not working for no reason is about 0.5 to 1% of the population. In 1981, say 1990, 86, 91, and by 1996, something happened to these guys. By 1996, the number of people who are not working for no reason shot up to about two and a half to three percent, and it stayed that way since. Now you think these are the, are the young people, you are wrong. These four lines are people in different age groups. Some of them in their 20s, some of them in their 30s, some of them in their 40s, some of them in their 50s. You think, you think not, not wanting to work is not a monopoly of the young. <laughs> it is not. Right? My wife sometimes says I don't work. <laughs> I, I just sit around at the university office. And, uh, <laughs> Oops. Too far. That was for men. This is for women. Right? Same pattern. Same pattern. <laughs> but the women discovered not working for no reason a little bit five or years after the men did. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know why. I don't have an explanation for why. But this is what happened. Right? So all of society decided, about 2 or 3% of the population in society decided that not working for no reason was fun, right? Compared to working, right? <laughs> Poor Singaporeans, they haven't discovered that yet. <laughs> what happened? I don't know what happened. I don't have a theory. I, I have a narrative, right? I don't have a lot of evidence that is compelling, but I have some circumstantial evidence. It may be coincidental. This is what happened. This is 1991. Beginning from 1991, our social welfare expenditure shot up. Wow. That rapidly. This is around the late 1990s. It slowed down, but moved up slower. But this is rapid move. This is really rapid move. If you pay people not to work, and economists believe they will re respond. Uh, they will respond. Uh, if you pay monkeys with peanuts, they will come. Right? So it's the same thing. Now, household income inequality. Household earnings is the sum of individual earnings. And we want to ask what has happened to that over time. It has become even more unequal over time. 
And again, the size of the household matters. Who marries who matters. Who divorces also matters. These are things that will determine household income. Now, let me talk a little bit about household income. It's very easy. I start out with this reading you a song. And, and let me give you an example of a theory without a fact. Here is a theory without a fact. Minimum wages have been introduced to help poor people. Will they do so? What is your intuition? Your intuition say obviously, you know, these are guys who are poor. They work 15 hours, $15 an hour. Now you pay them 28. Gee, they must do better, right? So this is what happened. Now, actually, no. Think about it more carefully. What proportion of the minimum wage workers are in low-income households? <laughs> now, people intuitively see, if you are a low-wage worker, you must come from a poor family. That's not true. My daughter is very low-wage and does not come from a poor family. <laughs> right? So don't assume because your wages are low, you come from a poor family. And here is what is the truth, based on facts provided by my favorite department in government, Census and Statistics Department, right? It's just that they, they never did this analysis when the minimum wage was debated. I did it after the minimum wage was passed, so that's, that's what academics do, right? We do it afterwards. These are low income, lowest decile household income. This keeps going. This is the highest income decile. How many people who have earned minimum wages come from the lowest decile? Right? Uh, in that group, what proportion of the lowest income people have a minimum wage worker? 3.1%. What happened to the other 96.9%? They don't earn wages below the minimum. The second decile has a little better, 6.7%. The third decile has 7% and so on. Interesting, even in the highest income group, you still have one or two percent of people in the uh, minimum wage. Who are they? My daughter. <laughs> but I, I'm joking. I mean, actually, I'm not there. I, I'm somewhere here. <laughs> Gotta feel good. Gotta right? feel good. The other thing is, educate marital sorting is important. We know educated men marry educated women. More women become has become well educated over time, and therefore more women are working in the labor force. Over time, households with well educated couples have become a two income family. Let me give you a simple illustration. M means men, W means women, and uh, I'm still old-fashioned, so I'm assuming the men makes $100 and women makes 50. I'm just assuming it, you know, old-fashioned approach, right? And the, whole, the household, when they get married, the blue talks about the old guys, you know, my father's generation. When they get married, the woman just stopped working. So what is household income? A hundred, because she drops out. He makes a hundred, so the total household income is a hundred. What has happened today? The red one is today. Guy makes a hundred. Hey, the women make 75 now. And when they get married, she works. Household income is 175. What has happened? As more married women, as more women become well educated, household income inequality widens. Is it a bad thing? Yeah, not really. Both were very happy the way they are, right? It's just an artifact of measurement. Now let us look at household with less well educated couples. Again, one family: men sixty dollars, women thirty dollars. And once they get married, she drops out. Household income is 60. Today, this is the past, this is today. Today the guy makes 60, he marries a less well-educated, but a woman who's more well-educated than previously, so she makes $45. Does 
When they get married, interestingly, she drops out of the labor force too because she's a low-income worker, and that is what we usually are. So household income remains 60. Wow, the gap has widened. 175 versus 60 as opposed to 100 versus 60 in the past. A well-known phenomenon. 50 years ago, most women did not work, even very well-educated women. Today, more well-educated women work, but many of the less well-educated still do not work. So household earnings, income inequality has widened. And this, has, this is a result of measurement. No deep theories there, it's just a measurement. Another thing has happened, single parenthood. Divorces have increased rapidly in Hong Kong, high among low-income families. And again, the example here is a rich family, men 100, women 100, they marry, they get 200. Poor family, men 50, women 50, after they marry, they get 100. Average household income between these two families is 150. Now, let's assume the poor family divorces. Why do the poor divorce? Because it's less costly. Think, think of Murdoch. Right? <laughs> now, rich family, divorces, stays together, men 100, women 100, total is still 200. The poor family divorces, men gets 50, women gets 50, all of a sudden, average household income, now we have three households instead of two. Average household income is 100. Right? Income disparity widens just because of divorce. Right? And if you ask the people who are divorced, are they happy? Yes. I mean, if not, why would they be divorcing? Right? I mean, it has to be a chosen option. Okay? Now, take a look what has happened in Hong Kong. This green line is the percentage of single parents with young children, and they have risen per thousand households, and they have risen rapidly. The little green line is the number of divorces granted per thousand household. It has also risen rapidly. The number of divorced individuals per thousand household has risen dramatically over this period. You know Hong Kong made the top 10 divorce rate country in the world. Yeah, these are the countries. Top is Russia, former member of the Soviet Union. Belarus, former member of the Soviet Union, United States, Gibraltar, Little Rock. <laughs> Moldova, former member of the Soviet Union. Belgium, no country. Cuba, former ally of the Soviet Union. <laughs> Czech Republic, well, kind of a strange place. Well, spring comes very likely in Prague. Switzerland, Ukraine, former member <laughs> of the Soviet Union, now further dismembered. <laughs> 2.8, Hong Kong is 2.9. We are solidly in top 10 divorce rate territory. If this came as a huge surprise <coughs> for me, I didn't realize we were so avant-garde. Now, this is what happened to us. This is the number of first marriages in Hong Kong. This is the first time a person married. So this is the first marriage. It's, it's about 40,000. It dropped off during the bad economic times. It's recovered now. It's about 40,000 people get 40,000 couples get married each year. Oops. This yellow line this yellow line is the number of divorces that were granted each year. And you notice the divorces really went up in the 1990s. And it move up more gently, but still going up. So the 1990s was a very important period of search. The other thing that happened, come in the late 1990s, another phenomenon happened. This is the green line. This is remarriage. Wow, people are remarrying very quickly, very rapidly. Yeah. 
This is remarriage. So how many people are remarried each year? And how many couples are remarried each year? About 23,000. That is about half of the number of people who are married for the first time. This number may well still go up. The other thing I want to share with you is this is men, and this is the number of divorced persons per household living in, who, the blue line are people who live in, who have private homes. The red line, red dotted line, are people who are living in HOS units, home ownership scheme units. The divorce rate, sorry, this, sorry, I'm wrong. Uh, the, the lower one are the folks who are living in um, home ownership units and private homes. You notice that the divorce, the fraction of divorced individuals in these households are significantly lower than the fraction who are living in rental units. The public housing estates and in private rental housing. The gap is very large. We're not talking about a small gap. You know, this is about 45,000. This is about 25,000. So the gap is almost, you know, twice. This is very serious business. Another thing, let me go back. This is men. Look at the women. Wow. Gee, say, if you live in private housing, that is, you're, you're a homeowner, or you live in subsidized housing, and you're also a homeowner, divorce rates are lower. If you're renting a unit, whether it's this public or private sector, your divorce rates are much higher. Significantly so. The other thing I want you to notice, see, the lines for the men are lower, the lines for the women are much higher. What does that mean? That means there are a lot more divorced women in the population than there are men. What happened? When you divorce, <laughs> don't you have two divorced persons? Yes, but then the men get remarried. <laughs> The, the women don't, or at least not so, so frequently or so extensively, right? So, so over time, the divorced men became married again and, or remarried again, and therefore in the population, more divorced women than divorced men because of remarriage. This is just another number. In, 19, in 2011, there were 78,000 divorced women in public housing, 33,000 in private renting housing, 20 something, right? You can read them. So for men, this, these are the figures for men all together, right? A lot more women in public rental housing. So what is the narrative now? Now I'm ready to talk about the narrative. So these are the information. What is going on? Why are there so many more divorced women than men? And men who get divorced can remarry for many reasons, but then what is the pool from which they can remarry? And the pool is, would be limited if they search only in Hong Kong. You have cross-border brides. This has fundamentally altered the opportunity set you can search in a much larger pool or be searched by a much larger pool. <laughs> After China's opening, many low-income single men, some of them divorced, some of them single all their lives, living alone, some of them probably even in cage homes or subdivided units, can now enjoy family life. It's a great game for them. This has increased, among other things, the demand for public rental housing. For almost two decades now, 40% of all marriages that take place between Hong Kong, a Hong Kong resident are cross-border marriages. It's a very fundamental change. At the beginning, those marriages were the pink ones. Who are the pink ones? These are men who apply for documentation to prove he is single. <laughs> Why, what is the purpose of that documentation? To get married in China. 
because China requires that if you wish to get married in China. So most of them got those, per, those uh, certificates and went across the border to get married. Over time, that number has dropped off to be replaced increasingly by people who are actually marrying here. But on the whole, the numbers are pretty stable, as you can see. I have some further narrative. I've given this talk a few times before, and every time when I reach this place, the women always ask me, well, these cross-border bribes, these are fake marriages. They come over, they get a Hong Kong ID card, and then they get divorced. Uh, they ask me, is that true? I, well, of course it must be true. Well, the question is, how true? <laughs> how true meaning, you know, is it 1% or is it 99%? From the look of the people who ask me, they were utterly convinced it must be 99%. <laughs> But then, being an economist who re respect numbers, I have to find them. But then I know there was no way I could find them, because how am I going to, to interview all these people? So I ran a regression equation to find out whether this is true. To see whether divorced people, whether recent immigrants are more likely to be divorced compared to non-recent immigrants or compared to a Hong Kong permanent residents. So what I did was to look at the following. If you were here, you were a recent immigrant here in five years, what is your probability of becoming divorced? Compared to someone who is not a recent immigrant. And the answer is, the probability of becoming divorced is much lower than a local person. These women came here not to look for ID cards. They came to look for a husband. <laughs> right? So they didn't abandon them. In fact, if you really think about it, did they abandon them after five, after 10 years? No. The probability is low. 15 years, still low. 20 years, still low. They actually are less likely to become divorced compared to local women. Significantly less. So what is the narrative? The narrative is they came here to look for a husband. They were probably quite alone. Their closest relative would be someone from a village. There would not be many of them. Why would they let go of the most important asset they have? You wouldn't. In fact, they would tolerate unhappiness rather than abuse. This is for men, though. Same for women. Women are actually even more loyal. I mean, they really stay on, right? So they don't. So what is the narrative? This is the narrative. Was he duped? Abused? Taken advantage of? Probably. But this must be a very exaggerated story. It's only good when it hits the headlines of newspapers. People read them. This is like a phenomenon of you know people biting a dog. And it gets into the headlines. When a dog bites a person, you know, it it's not news. Well, you know. Gee, you know, the great thing about internet is you can get down with all these photographs. I have no copyright, please. <laughs> and then take them. But this is really nice. In the mirror is the face of a little girl. Right? So who's duping who? Good. Now, I want to show you something different. And that is, how does a parent's schooling impact a child's schooling? Excess. We've heard some reports that other scholars have done, and I really tried to look at it very carefully. I think at least given the data we have, which is quite limited in our finding, this is what I did. I look at men and women in the age group of 25 to 29, 
and I try to find out what is their schooling. I try to find out what is their father's schooling or their mother's schooling. I try to control for problems of a statistical nature that arise that his father or mother may not be with him. I try to correct for those issues, statistical problems. And I want to examine whether your father has an education, how educated he was, had an impact on how educated you become. Schooling is actually the best measure of economic condition, better than income because income is noisy. I also try to assess whether mother's schooling had an impact on child schooling. It was important for me to measure it in a way that could be interpretable as a intergenerational elasticity. So what I did was uh, I adopted percentile ranking of their children's education and percentile ranking of their father's education. And I got this number. When I just analyze it, the income, the, the, the elasticity is 0 0.43, and it comes down over time, more or less, all the way until up here it is lower. So basically, the, remember, the higher the number, the worse the upward mobility. The lower the number, the better the upward mobility. The upward mobility has pretty much stay around 0 0.3 range for most of those years. Hong Kong's income mobility or intergenerational mobility is basically slightly better or about the same as that in the United States, has not changed a great deal over time. There was a period in 1990, one, where the numbers were very low. But that is because, I think, there were many people who left Hong Kong. Most of them middle or upper middle class people. And as a result of their departure, they left with their children, which created an opportunity for lower income or lower educated parents to, to have their children enter the universities with higher probability. So the 1990s was a result of people who left. So people whose children would have been admitted to university now left, giving greater opportunity to other children to enter the university in the 1990s. Another thing you notice is ownership. If you are a private homeowner or a public homeowner, your education advantage is positive. If you are a renter, it is negative. If you have a single father, it is negative, all through. If you are a single mother, it is negative. If, you do, if your father isn't around, your chances of getting into college is lower. If your mother is around, your chances of going into college is lower. If you live in a public housing estate, even controlling for your father's education, you have a worse chance. Why? But something in the air, in the public housing estate, is not right. I don't know what it is. Maybe they have bad examples. But then that's what Raj Chetting from Harvard found. Neighborhoods. Neighborhoods have an impact. Whether you have role models. Well, that's for fathers. The next is the mother. And just to let you know, the results are the same. Okay, so I did father's education, mother's education the same. So what have we now found? Household income inequality has increased a lot more. Individual income inequality has also risen, but not by as much as household income inequality. Intergenerational mobility did not change very much. The story is very similar to that of the United States. G. The problem is, you know, the United States is ahead of us in terms of divorce rate, but we are really catching up very fast. With that, if you don't notice, soon enough we'll be, be, uh, be as good as Russia. <laughs> Take it to the top. Or maybe we should tell the Russians to watch out, we're catching up. Okay. So. so should we be worried? Yes, but not about inequality. 
we should be worried about intergenerational mobility, particularly of certain groups of people who are growing up in single parent households, who are living in public housing estates. We should really be very concerned. Now, since Russia leads the way, I thought I should have a quote from Lenin, right? <laughs> what is to be done? Well, you need Head Start programs. You need Head Start programs for young people to give them an opportunity so that they're truly willing, entrepreneurial, want to learn kids from poor families have a chance. That is not being adequately taken care of because of family circumstances, of, because of where they live, neighborhood effects. In fact, I find this very wonderful quote that I want to read to you. And this is Alfred Marshall in his Principles of Economics, which was published 100 years ago, made this wonderful remark. The greatest capital that you can invest in is human capital. And of that, the most important component is the mother. <laughs> Gee, I guess, you know. That's why he's my favorite economist. Uh, <clears throat> some kids grow up in the worst of circumstances financially, living in some of the worst ghettos, and still they succeed. They succeed because an adult figure, typically a mother, maybe a grandmother, nourishes the kid. You know, Obama is a wonderful example of that. Supports the kid, protects the kid, encourages the kid. Somebody or some program has to spend time with the kid. It is a time-intensive activity. This overcomes the bad environment he was born into. You know, this is how backward humans are. You know, at the age of one year old, a toddler can hardly walk without assistance. A young horse, a fawn, can stand up within one hour and feed himself. Well, from the mother's milk, of course. But the, good, the good thing about children not growing up rapidly is there's an opportunity to intervene. If they grow up so rapidly, <laughs> there's no opportunity to intervene, right? So the fact that they are so stupid <laughs> is, should be turned into an advantage. Throwing money at it does not always work either. Notice what the U.S. war against poverty was doing 50 years ago was to give people money to change poverty and hopefully raise standards for the next generation. But it didn't seem to have done much good. What we failed to understand was that the real poverty was parenting or an equivalent substitute in terms of time spent. Of course, when the kid is starving and doesn't get any food, of course money matters, right? But then Hong Kong isn't in that situation, at least not for the majority. Now, it's getting late. I don't know what's the time. Uh, but if you agree, well, there'll be no QA session. <laughs> uh, because you know, I know you are hungry, and I would like to eat as well. Uh, so what we are getting now is kids growing up in a new form of child poverty. That new form of child poverty is actually threatening their ability to go to school, their willingness to learn, their attitudes and their motives. That's a major source of worsening intergenerational mobility and poverty. Home ownership will encourage the poor not to divorce. Because if you let people become a homeowner, they stop being poor. Divorcing becomes costly. If you have a house, even though if it's 200 feet, square feet, if you divide it up, it's only 100. And it's more like a coffin at that time. So you don't want to live in two coffins, and in any case, you can't live together. So it gives you skin in the game. Poor children get a better deal. So why should we still concentrate in public rental housing estates when divorce rates are high? A better model Role model in mixed neighborhoods is good for children's development, and the city of homeowners is less politically divided. Today, home ownership is not feasible, not for people with working on median income of 20,000 plus a month. 
we need a new housing strategy that not make people rent, but help them to own. And it doesn't cost anything, actually. You know, all the government has to do is just say, I will make you homeowner. After all, the most expensive part of a house or a unit is not the development cost, but the land value. It's merely a concept whether the person who occupies the land and owns it or rents it. Now we have most of them renting it. Just the land is unavailable anyway. So let me move on. It is possible to reorient our housing strategy towards home ownership, something similar to what Singapore has, so that the land premium on these housing units will be able to be given sold to poor low-income households at prices that are affordable to them. So if we do that, if we do that, if our long-term housing strategy were to focus not on rental housing, but on HOS units, we'll have a happy ending by 2023. Thank you very much.